Staff, are we ready? Oh, we're one member short, we'll just relax. Linda, ready? Mr. City Manager, we're good. <clears throat> we'll call the meeting to order. The regular meeting of the Capitola City Council for February 8th. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Harlan? Here. Councilmember Bertrand? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Councilmember Botworth? Here. Mayor Termini? Here. Would you all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> this meeting is being cablecast live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T Uverse Channel 99, and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m., and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m., on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed on the city's website. Our technician tonight is Lynn Dutton. Please turn off your cell phones. Please sign your name on the sign-up sheet if you wish for the record before you speak in front of council. And we'll first start with a report on closed session. <coughs> yes, thank you, Mayor Tremini, members of the city council. There were two items on this evening's closed session. First uh, was labor negotiations in which the council met with its negotiator <coughs> and gave instructions. Um, the, the negotiations concerned all bargaining groups. Second item was a liability claim, the claim of Richard Willis, which is also item D on this evening's consent calendar. There was no reportable action. Thank you. Are there any additional materials? None. Thank you. Before we begin the public comments on items not on tonight's agenda, I'll make an announcement, and my announcement is not in any way to dissuade anyone from speaking to us tonight. Everyone in this room is welcome to. I want to let you know after our last meeting's decision regarding the jewel box traffic, with the help of staff, we researched the process in going through and implementing what we voted on. And as usual with government, it's more complicated than anyone thinks. So this will be brought back to the council at our next meeting, February 22nd for a full hearing. Knowing that, anyone who'd like to speak to us? Come on up. <laughs> no. Please, Neil. Good evening. My name is Neil Savage. I'm a resident of Opal Street in the Jewel Box. I'm here to express my displeasure with the council's decision two weeks ago to adopt option four to reduce cut through traffic in the jewel box. My first point is how disappointed I am that the city council responded to a vocal minority and did not follow the clear wishes of the majority of the jewel box residents and did not follow staff recommendations. Many of us participated in the resident survey and community meeting, but two weeks ago, our participation and input were completely and without reason ignored. I feel duped. If you don't, f I don't feel the council represented its constituents and I was appalled by a response that I read as, you snooze, you lose. My second point is that the overwhelming desire by residents to have small incremental changes is appropriate because we have a very, very small problem. The panic from East Topaz made me wonder how bad it could be. But after a number of observations during rush hour, I never saw more than four cars total on the two blocks of East and West Topaz. After your surprising decision, I looked at the data and the worst case is only two cars a minute on each block of Topaz. This is not the village or the stop signs on Park Avenue. 
Go to Topaz and look, it's just two cars a minute. As I told you, this problem is not, as we told you, as we told you, this problem is not significant enough to merit any of the traffic rerouting options. My third point is the council was provided traffic options created from no data, no analysis, no modeling of cut through traffic, so no resulting design. We do not have comprehensive data on the number of cars coming in and leaving the jewel box. There was not even a count of the cars on 49th Street, a wide and safe pass through that will be eliminated. No one can tell us what measurable results of options four, what the measurable results of option four should be, and we'll be back arguing in front of you after it's done. But just for fun, let me try in a minute. I have left. Oh, I have more than a minute, but I, anyhow. <coughs> <coughs> The 20 households on East Topaz have convinced you to implement a solution that takes pass-through traffic off their block and off 49th and routes it all onto West Topaz. We have no data, but if 49th Street traffic equals Topaz traffic, the results of option four are one, a quiet ocean-facing cul-de-sac for the 20 households on East Topaz. Two, a major and 24 by seven inconvenience for the other 2,500 jewel box households. And three, twice the traffic for the 20 households on West Topaz. And all to eliminate two cars a minute for one or two hours a day, only during the week. Is this truly what you thought you were voting for? I'm asking the city council to agendize a vote to rescind option four. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> Welcome. Mayor and City Council, uh, my name is Mel Vento. I live on Topaz Street. I'm actually here with quite a few Topaz residents. Um, and I, I just wanted to first thank you. Um, the last meeting, really, we felt like we had some movement in addressing the safety issues on Topaz. And this has been going on for those in the audience. And I've seen a lot of um, next door neighbor comments. The commentary both on Next Door Neighbor and um, in that survey, the results were very disturbing. Um, personally, I am a people person um, and I told my husband, I said, this is very disturbing because it's a safety issue. It isn't um, that we're looking to raise our, increase our home, home value, but we are very concerned about what's the increasing traffic level and the safety issues what's happened on Topaz in the last four years. It's, it's been tremendous. And I, after reading all the comments, it was so disturbing to me because I feel like um, we are part of the jewel box. Topaz is not a standalone street. We are a community, Capitola is a community. And I, I wanted to just make sure that everyone knew that we first approached, um, a lot of my neighbors and myself approached the former police chief um, back in, we met with Rudy in February of 2015. If that gives people any idea of how long this has been an issue that, that we've been passionate about trying to get help with. And we didn't ask for any certain um, results, just some help in relieving the safety issues. And so I'm, I'm here to tonight to thank the city council for addressing it. Um, and I would ask people to be very compassionate and empathetic um, and understand that we are your neighbors. Um, if there was a, a, a crime issue on Opal or a crime issue on Diamond, I would hope that we would all support that effort. And in no way are we trying to punish the other residents of, of the jewel box. We're just asking for some help. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, Rose. Yes, <laughs> agreed. <coughs> Mayor Tamidi and Capitola City Council members, my name is Rose Felicetti and I'm a permanent resident of the Jewel Box on Opal Street. Thank you for responding to my first email with your emails, phone calls, and personal meetings with me, my husband, Neil Savage, and our Opal Street neighbor, Christy Donaldson. I know that many of our neighbors have been in contact with you. The purpose of this letter that I've already given to the clerk is to ask you to agendize this request to delay implementation of any changes to traffic patterns in the jewel box at your February 22nd council meeting and continue discussion with the entire neighborhood. So thank you. I am making my request about process. 
because I do not feel that my concerns and those of the majority of other jewel box permanent residents have been heard or that our traffic Surrey responses have been given serious consideration during your deliberations. <clears throat> I request that you delay any implementation until one, the traffic problem in the jewel box is identified. Is it safety, speed, volume, or some combination? Two, a real traffic study is done over multiple times of multiple days, multiple streets, and multiple northeast, southwest directions, and compared to historical patterns. Three, neighborhood meetings are held as was originally promised, to provide additional input and discussion by all of the neighbors in the jewel box. Four, if it's determined that there is a traffic problem, the entire neighborhood is a part of crafting a reasonable solution or solutions and some measures of how we will know that the problem has been solved. This is a contentious subject in the jewel box that you just heard that requires more discussion and deliberation than a single council meeting. I'm requesting transparency and reasonable public notice. Please over notice any public meetings that address drastic changes to traffic patterns in the jewel box by providing early and multiple postings of any public meetings using multiple channels of communication. A neighbor whose family has owned property in the jewel box since the 1950s has offered to walk the neighborhood with a petition to preserve the jewel box as is with no changes. Hallelujah. It is my hope that the wishes of the majority of the neighbors who occupy homes year round will be considered in any future deliberations. Thank you for taking my request into consideration. And I'll just turn to the audience. If you don't wish to speak, but you do support the concepts that I've laid forth, please raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Would anyone else like to speak? Come on up. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Paul Bellina. I live at 49th and Jewel, and uh, I'd like to thank you all for your service uh, and uh, trying to address a rather contentious issue. Um, uh, I guess I wanted to bring up one point that that I don't know if any of you have been to the city of Berkeley and, see, and seen what they've done with their streets in terms of stopping them midway through a block. Um, the signage, no matter what it is and how clear it is, never stops somebody from going down that street and having to turn around and come back, which to me doubles the traffic on my street. I, I hope you'll consider it. It's also, I'm an old guy, I'm getting to be 72 pretty soon. I can only play like four or five volleyball games a, a week, and uh, <laughs> and um, and I use that pass through uh, just like everybody else, and, and and I feel badly about the people on Topaz Street about having to put up with me going through over to the spa or down to the beach. But I hope you can come up with some other ideas, and um, I don't really have any. I was thinking maybe a one-way street uh, might help come in the other way. I don't know. Anyway, good luck and thank you again for uh, trying to solve this contention. Thank you. Next. Hello, Mayor, members. Um, I'm Sue Seeley. I live on Joel Street. And I don't have anything formal to say. I just, um, I just want to say that I come from a firefighting and a police family. And so safety is always number one concern. Ed, I know you're firefighter at some point. Um, I was wondering if anyone has done any kind of uh, survey or had a big rig come out, do some turnarounds, or uh, had the police chief or bat chief come out and just kind of take a look and see what the plan is. I mean, I know I would feel better knowing that they kind of gave the okay or the thumbs down. Um, that would be my request. Um, I, I don't remember your name, but I want to say that, you know, I agree with you that we're, we're all neighbors here and we all need to come together and it's starting to feel like there's this division. And, and I'm so glad you said what you did, that we have to remember that we're, 
you know, we're all living in, in this like paradise and we want to make it work. And so my formal request is if you haven't done it already, please contact fire department, police department, have them go through and just, it would, I know it would make me feel better knowing that Thank you. they gave their opinion. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm in Ron Burke. I'm a, a member of the Jill Box community. Thank you for listening to us. This is a real problem. I've said the last meeting, I saw it in video, I couldn't be here, but it's a real problem seeking real solutions. And I appreciate your, your emphasis on what you're trying to do. This is not a majority real solution that's gonna come into place. It's for the benefit of the community. Echoing what Sue said, it's very much the case. But one thing I would ask you to do as people, as people speak is consider not just the emotion. And the reason why I say that is because if you look at the survey results, all of, everyone says yes, there's a problem, and most people do. You look at all the solutions, no one agrees to any of the solutions. I think the reason why, this is just from our corporate background, people have a resistance to change. And because of that, they don't wanna see something change. So when you hear the rationale, please dig into what people are saying about what nuggets of truth there really are and what people are saying. Um, is there really is a problem. As a community, we all need to live with a solution, whatever it might be. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Welcome. I'm Jonathan Sisenya. I live on Opal Street. Um, I just want to first say that I'm opposed to closing public streets, which are designed for public use. While they are jewel box streets, they belong to the community as a whole. I agree that there is a problem with people driving dangerously through the neighborhood. I walk on the streets during rush hour. I drive home during rush hour. And people do drive too fast and not safely. But I think there are other viable options that haven't really been explored enough. And to start with, I think looking at the study that was done, it's not really an adequate traffic survey. In my work, I see traffic surveys. I see what actually goes into them. And what was done didn't really encompass everything. It didn't encompass safety response times from police, fire, ambulance. It didn't encompass whether the speed limit is reasonable on these streets. It didn't encompass a lot of things that should be there that I think if we're gonna look at this, we should look at it objectively. And I agree, we shouldn't bring emotion into this. We should look at it from an objective point of view. Um, when you do look at what is being proposed, it's gonna do a few things that personally are gonna affect me and they're gonna affect other people in this room. <clears throat> me, I commute over the hill every day. I choose to live here because I wanna be part of a smaller community where people are open and everybody, I like the sharedness <coughs> of this town. Um, but it's gonna lengthen my commute. In the morning, before I have to go deal with all the nonsense I deal with every day, I like to center myself. And one of those things I like to do is drive down to the end of the bluff and just take in the beauty that we get to live next to. And with this, it will affect me in that I'm not allowed to do that anymore. I'll have to drive all the way out to Capitola Road, back up to 49th and around. Other people I know, in this room, it will lengthen their commute. They also commute over the hill. Instead of being able to drive down their street to get to their home, they'll have to be stuck in what now isn't bad traffic on Capitola Road, but as we all know during the summer, it gets really clogged because everyone wants to share this community with us. It will also push that pass through traffic onto other streets, and we don't know what that impact is gonna be. Again, because I don't think there was an adequate traffic survey done. I'm asking that we use real objective evidence to solve this problem. I think there are viable options other than what we have here through law enforcement. Um, one good example of that that I've seen commuting over the hill, Highway 17 is a disaster. People drive dangerously, they take turns too fast, but they didn't close the road. What CHP did is they got more money to fund more officers to do enforcement, and I have seen a change. I also ask that we take the community wishes into account. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, my name is Jim Sherman. My wife and I are here. We live on Crystal Street, um, right just below 49th. Um, when Susan came around a couple months ago and kind of, it was a Sunday afternoon, we were having a a block party she stopped by and said hello introduced herself and said she was just kind of doing an informal survey talked about traffic problems and that and we talked about several different options 
I was really impressed. I thought, God, this is great. I live in a community where the, they come out and talk to you and find out what's going on in that. Watch the survey take place. Watch the outcome of it. I thought, well, the outcome of it seems to go along with the way my wife and I believe that we didn't see any really good options there. We, we filled out the survey. The one that you guys landed on was our worst pick and apparently was a lot of people's worst pick. Um, and it just kind of flew in our face as we never came back and talked and never had any input from anybody after that. You just kind of went off on your own and, and came to your own conclusions. You're making a hardship on the rest of the community to solve a very small problem. And I agree, there is a problem there. But there are, you know, I, I worked for many years up at the university. There are a lot of other ways to solve that problem. One of them would have been to put a police officer in there that writes tickets for people that are racing through the neighborhood too fast. Um, maybe put a no left turn sign there on, on uh, Bromer so you can't turn left onto 45th Street at certain times of the day, cutting down on the amount of, you know, commute traffic, things like that. that stuff never seemed to, I never saw any conversation about it. This just seems like a very half-baked idea that really needs to go back to the starting point and revisit it, because it's, the way it's going, it's just gonna make everybody mad. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Wait a second. Let me sign my John Henry here. Sure. Let's see without my glasses. Do what? Oh no! I think everyone knows that this will be a full public hearing in two weeks. Everyone knows that. I take action tonight. And no, there's no action tonight. But we're we're ready to listen and. We're not going to reduce any public input just because we're going to hear this again. Okay, you're off and running. Do I hit this button? No, somebody else will hit it for you. There you go. You got the green light. <laughs> uh, my name's Dwight Dillon. I live at 4980 Jewel Street in Capitola. Matter of fact, I've lived there for so long, it used to be 3rd Street. <laughs> uh, I was born in Capitola in 1945. I've lived in that house that I'm living in now since 1955. So as you can well imagine, I've seen a few changes. Matter of fact, I remember the, when I was three years old, I remember the gal that came to the door with a petition, because hardly anybody ever came to the door, to incorporate Capitola. So I'm three years older than the incorporated city of Capitola, for whatever that's worth. You know, so, well, anyway. Meanwhile, blasting through space here at about 17 miles a second. By and large, I think the city council does a really good job on keeping it together, you know? But in this time, you guys have really put your foot in it this time, man. <laughs> the voice of reason, thank God, was Stephanie. That had the brains to vote against something that's so insane that it just boggles the mind that you guys would even consider it. Um, <sighs> you know, there is a problem with traffic. There's a problem with traffic everywhere you go that there's cars, you know? Unless you make the jewel box a giant coldy sack with guard boxes on both ends and the whole thing. I don't see, you know, I, this gentleman that was just here, I mean, I hardly ever see the police up there. You, you need to really, you know, crack down on people, you know, and the people that do blast through there, you know, I mean, I don't know. It would just be nice to see more of a police presence, that's all. But you know, what really bothers me is the fact that people come in here, they have a, it takes a lot of dough to move into Capitola anymore, and it never was like that. 
This was a poor man's paradise. If my parents hadn't been able to buy that house in 1957 for 7,500 bucks, you know, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be living in Capitola because I couldn't afford to live here. Most people's houses are worth right around a million dollars now. So if there's something on your street that you don't like, that I strongly suggest that you call your realtor and sell out and move someplace that's a lot more mellower for you. I wish things were a lot more mellower too. As a matter of fact, I try to avoid going down that street anymore. I just go down Opal or my street or whatever. That's all it takes. I mean, maybe it just take a little signage to redirect traffic. I don't know, you guys. But it does bother me when people come here and they want to throw their weight around and they want to throw their money around. You know, that's not where it's at, man. I mean, I've had some of the neighbors over the years have bitched about the trees in front of my house, that they're dirty and they drop leaves and all this stuff, you know. What they don't realize is that trees make dirt and without dirt we'd all be starved to death a long time ago. Okay. No. <laughs> You know, I well, hold on, hold on. I think, you know, 60, 70 years in Capitola, if you have anything else to say, go ahead, you got to say it. The hardest thing for human beings to do is just to leave things alone. People are continuously doing things when they should be just hanging out, laying on the beach and having a good time. That's what Capitola is all about, not bitching about the, <laughs> you know, the traffic and the, the, the fact that the population swells to that of downtown Hong Kong on the weekend and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty tough sometimes, you know, but I don't mind sharing it with people. But, you know, as long as we have cars, I mean, you know, I was just telling my friend Tom, you know, like, I think it was the general plan for 1970 or something was to have cars completely eliminated from the Esplanade, you know. It'd be nice if all, you know, we could just ride bikes and horses and stuff like that, but, you know. You know, automobiles are a blessing and they're also a curse, man. So you gotta, you know, you gotta live with the blessing. It's, you gotta take the blessing along with the curse, you know, or the curse along with the blessing. That's the deal. So, in conclusion, I would just ask you guys just to leave it alone. If people can't stand the traffic, let them sell their houses. Christ on money, they could. Uh, friends of mine just sold a house on Ape on, that they lived in for 30 years, 40 years on Emerald, and they got, I don't know, two or three hundred thousand, half million dollars more than they paid for it, or than they wanted even. You know? So well, there's other places, you know? If you can't stand the gap, it's time to get the real estate sign out and say sayonara. <laughs> okay, who's the brave person who wants to follow that? <laughs> oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else before we close? Well, then step right. If you're going to speak, you get it. Come on up. Come on up. Thank you. Um, my name is Jim Donaldson. I live on Opal Street. I, street. I want to thank you. Or I'm glad to be here in front of the Capitola Traffic Council. I mean, City Council. Um, oh, no, you, had it, you had it right. You had it right. You got that. <laughs> um, I had some. I've spent a lot of time looking at the results. Um, my wife and I have talked about the results a lot and the issue and what can we do. And I, I crunched some numbers and I had some really good points. I, I put them down on here. I was going to talk about them and then Neil mentioned them all. Mr. Savage mentioned them all. Um, so, <laughs> um, he mentioned, I think that um, living close to Opal, there's always been traffic on Topaz. <clears throat> it averages one car an hour. It doesn't seem like a big deal to me. What I would add is that um, I don't believe that Topaz is dangerous. My family and I are many times a day, usually, back and forth to 41st, um, walking or biking, typically down, um, we might go down Opal and come back through Topaz. Um, not one time have I come back and felt unsafe. Not one time if I come back and said, oh, you know, Topaz is really busy, I'll jog over to Opal and go back. As a matter of fact, if it's sunny out, I'll take Topaz because there's more sun, because there's a lot of shade on Opal. So I don't see any concerns uh, with the street, being there uh, as a frequent user. Um, earlier this week, my wife and I were walking with our dog, 
and two cars were coming to cross at about the same point we were, and a cyclist was coming at the same time. And we all just sort of looked at each other like, how's this gonna work? And we stepped aside, let the cyclist go through, the cars basically stopped, and we walked past, everything was fine. Um, There's no issue, that's, I think, how it, how it has been in my experience, hasn't been dangerous, so thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mick, you want the last word, Mick, or do you want to come up now? Yeah, no problem. Come on up. Thank you. But, uh, Welcome. Good evening. Thank you for uh, listening to everybody. And uh, what I'd like to say is I don't think anyone here is, is here to diminish the concerns of, of Topaz Street. I think we all realize that, you know, their concerns are valid concerns. I'm not sure we all agree on the traffic counts at this point, but, you know, I think they have some valid concerns. But I think what you're hearing here tonight is I think there's a consensus that this decision you've made is an ill-informed decision, that you don't have the information you need to really make the decision you made. We don't know what the impacts will be on 45th and Capitola Road, 49th and Capitola Road, 47th and Capitola Road, Cliff Drive down into the village and the Wharf Road Stockton intersection. We don't know what the impacts will be on emergency service response. So I think all we're asking for is that the council undertake a comprehensive traffic study, defer the decision you made until that traffic study is complete so you can make an informed decision and look at variable alternatives that may work better than what you've chosen. That's it. Thank you, Mick. Okay. Step right up. Thank you. Thank you for all your attention, what you're trying to do to solve this difficult you know, problem here. Uh, my name is Marcos Vescovi. I live on Topaz Street. And uh, uh, it just happens that uh, uh, this morning I was in Redwood City participating on the sentencing of the man who drove and killed a 47-year-old friend of mine who was also a senior engineer at Apple where I work. And, uh, and I was able, I was able to, to see like the pain that it caused like in my, my friend who died and left two children and also even the pain of the man who caused the accident and killed him. So that was incredible. So we are here talking very lightly, and we know like we all like who live in uh, Topaz, we know what we're going through, there's cars rushing through a lot. We, we have a three-year-old son that we have to have two locks on the door on each door right now because we're afraid he can somehow open the door and go to the street. And it's really that we don't want this amazing neighborhood that we have to end up in a situation like that where someone is gonna get killed and we're gonna come back to remember this day. Okay, so this is not about how fast I go and I drive to see the ocean, how easy it is for me to go to my swimming class. No, we are talking about serious stuff. So that's first point. Second point on a more positive note, I have friends from Berkeley who saw the change that caused uh, in that neighborhood where they protected and it changed the traffic and became amazing, it's amazing. They are really happy that change that neighborhood is known right now all around for being a great place to live. And I think that if we make some changes, I don't know exactly whether it is, what's the best changes, if it is the one you're suggesting, but we can make this neighborhood amazing, right? A place where we can walk around, we can get to know each other. And I, I, you know, I don't think people are really thinking about what this can become. Okay, so that's, that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Next. I'm Beverly Martin. I live on Emerald Street. Welcome, Beverly. And thank you, get thank you for a little closer to the microphone for us. Thank you for letting us all be here. Thank you. Um, I personally uh, am not for the blockades, but I just want the community to know that I will make an effort to go different routes simply because my neighbors uh, need me to. And so I just wanted to add that as uh, part of being in this community. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one else, thank you for participating in the items not on tonight's agenda, but they will be in two weeks. I'm sure I'll see every one of you. And you know, in, in spite, a little editorializing here, in spite of the, um, uh, the, the apparent gaffe that we maybe went too fast too soon, I, I think you can be thankful you live in a community where not only you can email your representatives, but you recognize them at Knob Hill. So none of us can hide. <laughs> We're here, we live with you, we live on the same streets, we drive the same streets. I'm glad I live here. Any bigger government than this, I don't care much for, 
but this is just right. Thank you all for coming. We'll take a couple of minutes in case you all want to get up and go. Or you can stay and watch government in action and what else we're going to mess up here. <laughs> That out. He's like a couple of years older than me. Oh. Yeah. 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 Never seen him It's the first time I've seen him too. Wow. He could be a stand-up comedian. That guy's hysterical. He, uh, he might have been years ago. That's where I met. What him. Is it in the movie? Sure. If you eat half of it. Check yourself. Sorry. You want me to text that back? Don't go to the email. Give me a second. Hey, hey, did you clear the room or what? Okay, so it's ready to go. I guess none of my Are you comments matter me? anymore. Okay. Boy, this young lady's still here. Transparency has been kind of pushed aside because I live on tr Trash on Crystal Street. And Did you get a notice about the meeting? No, no yes. I, 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 <coughs> no, on the last meeting. Uh, yes, I got a notice on it, yeah, but okay. uh, not not officially. You didn't get, get a card in the mail. We didn't send one oh, out to the last meeting. Yeah. No, that's why well, they didn't know about it. He said he got a card in the mail. No, they, we didn't. Not not two weeks ago. I'm gonna, I'm gonna question it when we reconvene. I'm gonna ask about the noticing on this. And make sure everybody knows what's happening in two weeks. Well, the only thing I want to reiterate is that uh, transparency and communication is a big problem. We work on it every day. We'll, we'll continue to. Regulation, what other agencies do, looking for Yeah, we should have noticed the last meeting. I think I that's thought, why they didn't know about it. That's actually, why they're surprised. Yeah. We took action. Well, we, well that's what I'm going to question them on. Because I, I got that my note on my paper. Because I want to I spread the noticing out there further. Bother if we found it out. It's got to cover all the way to Capitola Road. It's got to go all the way from 49th to 45th. Might as well cover them all too. Hi there. Well, I think what I'd like them to do is to narrow down. Do they want us to look at? Oh yeah, I'm not asking. This not. we're going to. That we'll come back um, later we're not making any decisions. We're going to ask the staff to bring back what an ordinance would look like, whether it be sales, processing, or cultivation. I can tell you, these are non-starters completely in Capitola. No kind of. There's no possibility of no cost sales. Uh, we're talking about potentially a couple of licenses on 41st Avenue for retail stores. And it's, it's up to the, uh, it'll be a full public hearing probably in four weeks on this. But this is just for the staff. For us to talk to the chief, for us to direct to the staff, what we want to see. We can just knock it out and say, we're not doing that. We're asking to make an ordinance. We're asking to just bring back the fact that there's a retail cultivation manufacturing. Probably not something that Capitol would be interested in. You know, it's on the end of every one of our streets. 41st Avenue. Asking the chief and just thank you. Oh boy. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's changed already. Yeah. No hash plan. No. There's, there's not going to be any decisions made. Like I said, we're just going to ask for it. It's more fact finding. Do you, do you have a business in town? Or? Oh, okay, so you just uh, yeah. uh, next item. Yeah. 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 Excuse me. We need to to continue the meeting. Thank you. 
Okay, we'll reconvene. And staff, what is the, and maybe Rich, you can um, speak to this. Uh, this is under, uh, we haven't done staff or council comments yet. So does staff have any comments? We have no comments this evening. Um, I'd like to ask staff how far we, how far did we notice for last the last meeting we had regarding the jewel box traffic and did we actually formally notice with cards in the mail? Does anyone know? Uh, there were no cards from the clerk's office. We didn't send any cards out? For our, for the next meeting when we're, when we're having this come back to us, is it possible for us to send out notice cards? And let's go a little further than 300 or 500 feet. It seems like the jewel box itself from Prospect to 45th, from the cliffs to um, Capitola Road should get noticed, yeah? So we, when we did the survey, we right. did a 2,000 residences, which is the greater jewel box area. Oh, good. And then when we, this last one, we sent out emails to those that um, gave us emails at work that responded. Right. We did not mail any postcards. We can do that same mailing to those 2,000 residents. That would be great. Anything we can do to inform more people, uh, it would help okay. the transparency that's been, people have been pining for. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll go to council comments. Ed, nothing. Kristen. No. Mr. Jacques. Yeah. Um, so at the last RTC meeting, I um, talked to uh, the council and um, George Andero during his presentation. And I know uh, Capitol has concerns about the trestle. Mike has brought this up multiple times. And as I reported last meeting, I asked for a, um, a study on that uh, last year sometime, and they didn't follow through on that. And so um, got down to the fact that they still haven't moved forward on that, but they are gonna do an overall study of all the different uh, trestles and crossings. And um, the important fact here is we can't have any trains moving right now anyway because near Watsonville. So they do have the time to do that. I asked for a time frame. I did not get a time frame. Um, as the council also knows and anyone that's listening knows, I'm very concerned about the unified quarter study. And I asked George Dondero to report at each meeting new actions that have occurred. And this last meeting, he did report that um, our consultant, uh, RTC's consultant, is finalizing the standards or the, the different things they take into account when they're trying to figure out how to move forward in doing the evaluation. So I asked for that to be brought back to the RTC. Uh, took me a little, a little pushing to make that happen. So basically, I want the public to know what standards um, the consultant is going to be using when they analyze the results of their study. And I think that's very critical because those standards can go all sorts of different ways. And I want to make sure that the public understands how the consultant is going to be looking at the results of their study. And so I'd like to emphasize to the public that it's very important to keep on top of the unified quarter of study and let the consultant know that they're being watched. This is extremely important for this community. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie. I attended um, the uh, Soquel Creek Water uh, Board meeting this week, and I usually watch them at home, but sometimes I come down. Um, and they had some very interesting information on their agenda, including a fish study that they're working on. And that reminded me that we have a wonderful brochure called Your Guide to Soquel Creek, and I would love to reprint that and then we can walk it on both sides of the creek because the biologist said that she was really surprised how many neighbors and people that she's talking to when they're doing their studies and so forth that have no idea that there's fish in creeks or what kind of fish or whether they're endangered or uh, threatened and, and so forth and so forth. So I said, aha, let's get that brochure out. I don't know how much it'll cost to reproduce it, but if we could check on that and get a bid back and print however many we need for, for all the residents along Riverview and we passed it out about 20 years ago or 15 years ago, but we should we need to do it every five years. Look at all the new look at all the new residents that we have, that need to know what's in their backyard and how to take care of it, and so forth and so forth. So I'd like to, to do that, um, if that's all right, Mr. City Manager. Come back with the cost of that. Who has that the the We have content. it upstairs in the lobby. It is. I, yeah. That's great. It drops to drops. I think I saw a couple of copies. No, it's called no, your, it's guide to, your Guide to uh, Soquel Creek. No, I had... Residence I, Guide to Soquel Creek. I received one of those books in um, in one of the kitchen drawers 
when I moved on to Wharf Road, <laughs> and it was stunning, and I wish I had Beautiful booklet. stolen it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but at that last Steve, event, you know, so I just want to add, the Commission on Environment actually took redistributing that on, and it is on our website. If you go to our environmentally sustainable habitat page on our website, we've scanned it in there. And they have contacted and, and delivered it to a lot of the houses in the last year. Now, it doesn't mean everybody got it, but it, they did not make an effort. But we can certainly redo that effort. But that was one of their goals that they undertook last Good. year. Good. Yeah, I just think that let's put it on their work program or somebody's for like every couple years right. to do it. At least knock on, we can knock on the door. If it's a new person, give it to them. If it's not, then just at least make, have that presence. And I think I think they took the available that we had. We had a box, and they took those and redistributed those. We didn't do another printing. Well, let's do another printing then, right. because okay. and see where we are. Don't go. Don't go too far. <laughs> go ahead, Stephanie. Anything else? Yeah, um, I would like to um, look at uh, changing banks from Wells Fargo just to get that information. We may be able to do it or may not, but just to get that a report back on that. And uh, Saturday the 24th is a soft opening for the museum. It's for volunteers. So if any of you want to volunteer, become a volunteer, you can come to this museum orientation and um, otherwise the uh, museum will be opening to the public a little bit after that. Historic Museum. Capitola Museum, yeah. yeah. And that's all, thanks. Steve. Um, I think maybe the time has come for us to do a little energy study on the on the tennis courts about perhaps replacing those lights with LEDs and it will give us the ability to focus the photometrics in such a way it doesn't bother neighbors and perhaps we can also look at um, making each court a separate timer shouldn't be hard to do and also maybe adding a few lights on the court clo on the tennis court closest to the basketball court on its own timer so perhaps basketball players can play after dark because right now they go in and they turn on the entire tennis courts to play basketball. Okay. So I think all in all, we could probably save money in the long run. The, the ROI should be less than two years. And I think Ed just moved up to the microphone. Did you have a basketball okay, question? We, no, I just wondered if that's something we should put on my budget proposal because it sounds like it's going to probably be involved. Not, not that it's not a great idea, but it's... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that l to look at when we come back with CIP and the yeah, mid-year we'll and look things at like it that. And kind of get some numbers. And, and there might even be, I think there might even be a grant for cities replacing uh, HID lights with LED and the, the energy savings involved. Okay. We'll great. To it. Thanks. And Steve, when you and I talked about this last week, you brought up the fact it could all be directional. So we don't have to worry about next door neighbors and stuff like that. But yep, yep. You know, I did find this out from people when I was talking with the jewel box neighbors and they were bringing this up. They were basketball players themselves and they're complaining about the lights not being sufficient for the basketball, but not good enough for the, uh, was it the tennis courts too? So there's some complaints on both sides actually. All right, I hear you. Great, any other public, any other comments? I don't see our treasurer tonight. So uh, we'll move on to the consent calendar. <clears throat> I'll move the consent calendar. Second. Anyone in the public like to pull anything on the consent calendar? I Seeing do none. Do have a yeah, question? Oh, wait, hold on. Wait, public first. Oh, right. so yes. No. Step right up. I don't know when the proper time to speak is about this, but I want to actually comment on something that's on the calendar tonight, the last agenda item. Oh no, uh, I'm talking about the consent calendar, oh, which sorry. is, which is just a list of items um, that are taken as a single motion. It has nothing to do with the general government. I understand why you're here. Okay. Good enough. Um, Anyone want to pull anything? It's all good. I have a motion and a second. A question. Question. Go, Go ahead. ahead. So what came up with the Historic Museum in terms of conflict of interest? Was that an oversight when this was adopted originally or um, did something bring this up or? I think it was uh, maybe the city clerk can answer. It was regarding regards to board members and their filing. Yeah, I know. Yes, when we reviewed their uh, bylaws, we realized that they had so responsibilities. So it was just an oversight. Yes. Okay, got it. Okay. Thanks. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Consent calendar passes, and we'll move on to general government. First item, Monterey Bay Community Power Update, and our action is just to receive the report. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mark Adotto here. Uh, I Mar Mar let me just give a little bit of an introduction for Mark because he's here at, at, at staff's request. As a reminder to the council, um, Michael and I both sit on the different boards for Monterey Bay Community Power. Michael's on the policy committee, which oversees the broad policy structures. We roll out this new public power company, and I sit on the operations board on behalf of Capitol, and it's been a really exciting process so far. We thought it was a great opportunity to bring Mark 
here into town to help spread the word about what's coming up and what's coming down the pike and also share what the outreach plans are going to be uh, for our community. So, Mark, sorry to interrupt you, but I just wanted to kick it off. Not a problem. A uh, thank you for the introduction and sure. the warm welcome. Uh, I come to you from um, 14 years in uh, work with the City of Santa Cruz and the Public Works Department, uh, many uh, uh, contentious neighborhood traffic calming meetings <laughs> and uh, capital improvement projects relating to sustainable transportation, uh, as well as six years on the board with Ecology Action when we went statewide with an R funded grant and uh, remodeled the uh, Sentinel Building uh, with our tenants in common. And then uh, more recently as your campaign manager for the successful Yes on Measure D. So now the outreach coordinator for Monterey Bay Community Power. Very excited about it. Uh, what I did, a uh, little bit last minute change up in terms of the uh, slides that I wanted to present because uh, as these gentlemen know, we had a strategic planning meeting that was January 20th with both boards present. And uh, a lot of uh, very good information was presented that relates to the complexity that we're all beginning to uh, wrap ourselves around in terms of this hybrid model uh, co called community choice aggregation. So uh, I'm trying to fold some of that in, get to the updates. If it gets too detailed, circle the wagons and, and we'll move on. It's, it's a work in progress. Um, I think we all know uh, how we got here. We've got, uh, you know, um, 16 cities and all three counties participating in this. Uh, the only two uh, cities not are, um, what is it, uh, King City and Delray Oaks. Uh, the particular model, uh, as mentioned, is uh, a hybrid model where we uh, bring cleaner energy sourced uh, generation. We're using the same service provided by PG&E and we're providing our customers uh, in the counties uh, with a choice for who they're going to buy their electricity from. We offer 3% rebates to all our customers uh, across the board for all of PG&E's rate schedules. Uh, PG&E continues to provide the power, the transmission, the distribution, customer metering, and customer billing. So our bill will be a, an add-on to that existing bill. Uh, any surplus revenues uh, are going to fund local energy programs and uh, projects and help stimulate our local economy. We're looking at net operating revenue projected of uh, anywhere on the order of 44 to $55 million a year. So this is uh, tremendously significant. We um, are basically, well, I'll, I'll hit the goals in a second here. Um, a four and a half year effort, yeoman's work, thousands of hours of staff and community volunteer time, a uh, uh, fiscal sponsorship from the Community Foundation in uh, Santa Cruz, and finally a joint powers formation in uh, I think it was March of uh, 2017. In terms of the structure already mentioned, this is very unique. Uh, so for Ca California's first tri-county CCA, uh, we also have uh, I think the only one that's set up with two boards. Uh, we've got a policy board as mentioned and an operations board. Uh, we have a, a transparent open to the public monthly meeting and the way that the um, uh, participation uh, was formulated was essentially based on population. So those uh, cities or counties that had 50,000 or more got a seat and the smaller population cities were basically grouped up in shared seats. Uh, San Benito with a little lower population but they got a full seat because they're county. <coughs> Next slide. Uh, let's see, so just a quick org chart. I want to make mention that uh, we feel very fortunate to have uh, Tom Habashi who uh, just completed the su successful launch of uh, sustainable, uh, I always mix it up, uh, Silicon Valley's clean energy last year uh, as our CEO. So to have somebody uh, at the helm who's got 30 years of energy trading experience is extremely valuable in terms of getting us uh, off to a quick launch. Essentially, uh, four divisions, um, regulatory and legislative, internal ops, power uh, resources and energy programs, and then marketing and uh, public affairs. In terms of our core values, uh, very simple, uh, cleaner energy and affordable rates and 
local programs and benefits on the economic side. Uh, those are our driving uh, mission goals. So let's get into a little bit about how the grid works without getting uh, too mired in the details here. Uh, electricity is a very unique commodity. It's uh, used obviously to power everything. It needs to be stored immediately and supply and demand must always come into balance. Uh, consumptions measured in uh, either kilowatt hours or megawatt hours or gigawatt hours and then the capacity is to actually produce this energy that's consumed and this can be either deployed or remain idle and it's measured in kilowatts, megawatts and gigawatts. So to give you a little sense of the scale for Monterey Bay Community Power, uh, we need to source annually about 3,700 gigawatt hours a year to service about 235,000 uh, residential uh, customers and about 37,500 uh, commercial, industrial, ag, and municipal accounts. On the actual power side, uh, we need about 713 megawatts of peak load per month, and that's in the uh, peak summer. So to just give you a little idea of, you know, what our demand is. Uh, this is essentially just a slide to show you the need to step down the power uh, as it moves along the transmission uh, system to make it usable for us. So now let's swim into the pond in which we are actually operating here. Uh, these slides are coming from Pacific Energy Advisors who uh, uh, drive our analytics. They're part of the technical feasibility study and they're uh, on our consultant team now. And, and uh, Kirby was there at our strategic planning meeting on the 20th. So we are uh, part of the Western uh, Interconnected Grid. Uh, this includes parts of Canada as well as Baja. I did not know that. On the uh, statewide uh, regulatory side, obviously we've got the Public Utilities Commission that's uh, regulating. We've got the uh, California Energy Commission that's doing all the planning. And then the California Air Res Resources Board, which is uh, monitoring air quality. In terms of uh, the grid, uh, you've got uh, all the production on one side, natural gas, coal, nuclear, hydro, wind, solar, and biofuels. Uh, this is what's going into this uh, eight full states on the western grid, uh, six partial states and two provinces in Canada as well as the Baja, Mexico. And it's providing uh, electricity to our independently owned utilities, the publicly owned utilities, CCAs, and direct access among others. Uh, who generates the power in California? Uh, you can see from this slide all of the hydro that's on the eastern side of the state and the uh, solar that runs down Central Valley. Essentially, there are over 1,000 electric generating units that are greater than one megawatt. There's 80,000 megawatts generating capacity in the state, and that's oversupply from what we need. 54% uh, of capacity is um, from natural gas, so that's our baseline load. 68% uh, of California's energy approximately is produced within the state, 15% is imported from the northwest, 17% is imported from the southwest, and I think it's closer to 30% of California's generating capacity uses renewable sources right now. This data is a little old. Uh, this is just to give you a sense of uh, who the major utilities are, obviously, that's uh, PG&E, Southern California Edison, and San Diego Gas and Electric, amongst some other smaller ones around the state, like uh, Sacramento Unis Municipal Utility District, and then the various uh, CCAs, which are coming along uh, quickly. Uh, nine so far, and I think I heard this week uh, Los Angeles County, now Los Angeles Clean Power, is aggregating 28 cities to form their uh, community choice energy program. Energy product and services for CCAs. So on the electric energy uh, is procured through uh, term energy contracts and this mitigates risk. There's been a lot of conversation on the operations board and the policy board side on just how we're going about doing that. And uh, I'm getting to understand the complexity of that, not my area of expertise. Uh, renewable energy, it's procured to meet the renewable portfolio standards uh, that are mandated by the state. And I asterisk this because other specified energy products, uh, greenhouse gas free, typically hard hydro, um, and non-renewable portfolio standard eligible products are generally procured to meet uh, internally defined policy objectives. Well, that's us. 
So we source 30% renewable energy uh, from the most expensive bucket and the rest, 70%, is coming from uh, n large hydro from the Northwest. And this was done as a strategy to make sure that our rates were competitive uh, with PG&E and uh, would allow us to build a uh, fiscally sound foundation for this agency. So very strategic in that regard. Resource adequacy. Capacity is a big issue at the California Public Utilities Commission. It's going to be an ongoing issue regarding uh, the uh, legislative uh, regulatory uh, schedule for uh, this coming year. We're going to continue to need uh, your support in terms of advocacy as these uh, bills are brought forward this year. In terms of scheduling coordinator services, this is a um, subcontractor that we have that basically um, helps manage the forecast uh, load that we're required to service all of our customers and transactions are basically settled up with the California independent system operators. And I'll look forward to uh, understanding more about how that actually works. In terms of contracting options, a variety of contracting options are available in regards to short, mid, and long-term pricing structures. And this gets into the complexity of what we're actually doing on the operations side for this business. <coughs> Renewable energy products. Three buckets. Basically, you could look at bucket one, which is what we're sourcing. It's located, renewable energy located in the state of California or dynamically scheduled into California. And you're basically buying the energy or the electrons that are bundled with the renewable energy uh, certificate, rather. So that's the attribute that assigns that uh, amount of energy uh, as to what it is at its source. And then once it's assigned and moves into the system, it just joins the grid with all the other energy that is being uh, produced and put into the grid. It's the most expensive of the three. Uh, I think there uh, have been, over time, some objections raised by using some of these other renewable energy sources, bucket two and bucket three, uh, as perhaps not uh, incentivizing uh, the development of renewable energy in the same way. So that's why we went with the more expensive uh, bucket one. That's our 30% renewable energy, and it allows us to meet the state mandates uh, that we must comply with. Scroll up a little bit here. Uh, in terms of energy procurement, all renewable energy production uh, is substantiated via these renewable energy certificates. That's the ownership. And uh, as we all know, 33% renewable portfolio standard mandated by 2020 and 50% by uh, 2030. Here you can basically see the upward trend. It's uh, a little less than 2% per year from 2015 to uh, 2030 in terms of moving our renewable portfolio standards. Um, CCAs, we need to demonstrate that we've actually uh, met the specified portions of our annual electricity sales. Uh, through these renewable energy credits. Uh, this was a slide that was misconstrued, so I apologize for that. But essentially, it was to show that uh, PG&E is meeting its 69% renewable energy uh, uh, portfolio, if you will, by including 24% of nuclear power. And uh, we do not uh, purchase any nuclear power or any unbundled renewable energy certificates. And the other 70%, as I mentioned, is coming from large hydro. So just drawing some distinctions about what is carbon-free energy. <coughs> I actually brought that slide back in with my computer. Uh, so here you can see the 24% uh, for their uh, nuclear, which is actually being decommissioned. Uh, next slide is just to basically show you that it's the load generators that are prompting California independent uh, system operators to then go to the market and uh, source the power supply. Uh, in terms of policy changes, I'm not going to get too detailed with that, but I did want to bring up this uh, duck curve, which we went into in our strategic planning meeting, because this really goes to the value proposition that you're going to hear about from uh, the various folks in the community that you're meeting with. Uh, there is going to be a need to balance uh, the operational needs of uh, Monterey Bay Community Power with the desire 
to uh, build more local renewable energy. How am I doing on time? Doing okay? You're doing all right. I I'm running your PowerPoint from here, though. You are? I am now. So I can get a full screen. So oh, okay. you tell me when you want the next slide. Next slide. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. So uh, with this duck curve, basically what you're seeing is that uh, peak uh, power demand has been pushed later into the day. Uh, obviously, the renewable energy in terms of solar and wind is coming in uh, at the trough of the day. And what we're running into, because we have incentivized so much renewable energy without storage, uh, we're uh, in a position where we run the risk of over generation of renewable energy. It's being sold right now out of state at a loss because we don't have a place to store it. So one of the, uh, I think, exciting benefits in terms of uh, CCAs being able to shift and push the market is that uh, we have, uh, pardon me, contracts with uh, Silicon Valley Clean Energy that we're in negotiation with to uh, get bids for 240 megawatts of uh, both renewable energy, solar, uh, and wind, I believe, uh, with storage. So um, this is how we are basically moving the market, which really needs to happen. And uh, I think just last week, Tesla announced doing large-scale utility battery storage in Australia. So the technology is coming on board. This is very exciting. And, uh, and if they know that somebody is there to actually purchase this, then they're going to go ahead and build it. So that's our ability to in, uh, incentivize uh, this shift to get the storage capacity that we need. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> next slide, please. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. And I'll, I'll just I'll follow along. Uh, how we're saving money, obviously no shareholders and dividends being paid out. Uh, balanced priorities in terms of uh, greenhouse gas reductions, lower cost to our customers, and investment in our local community, and the public accountability that goes with the transparency of a joint powers authority. Next slide, please. And now we'll get to where are the risks. So this basically depicts on the left side here uh, PG&E's transmission and distribution charges. So that's the darker circle, the bigger circle. And what it is indicating is that they bundle in to their overall generation rates, which are a little over 11 cents per kilowatt hour, um, their, uh, how do you say, uh, power indifference charge adjustments, their exit fees, their franchise fees. So it all gets sort of nested in, and it's not transparent. Now, if you look at the uh, Monterey Bay Community Power Service model, we basically have to separate that out. It's a cost that they pass on to us, these exit fees. Uh, they are essentially stranded costs that the utilities say, well, we've procured power on your behalf, long-term contracts, there's a cost to that. You've uh, moved to your own uh, power procurement, so we need to transfer those costs over to you. So we break that cost out. You see what it is, it's about two and a half cents per kilowatt, and our generation charges are about eight cents per kilowatt hour, and that's the generation amount that we pay the rebate to our customers. That's the kind of green, green rebate that drops down to the bottom. Next slide, please. Uh, let's see, economic vitality and local choice. I think we've gone over the benefits. Uh, I know that people are very excited in terms of looking at distributed generation for wind, solar, and biomass, uh, energy efficiency retrofits, the built environment, demand response, the battery storage I've mentioned, uh, electric vehicles, basically electrifying our transportation system. This would, of course, include the aging fleet. Uh, I was just up in Scotts Valley where Alex gave his annual report out uh, in terms of the uh, uh, needs that are uh, going to need to be met by Metro as they want to move toward a new fleet that is zero emission, maybe something we can help leverage them uh, with to help. Um, obviously, net metering and feed-in tariffs as other programmatic uh, things that we can do. Next slide. So let's go to uh, the programs and the launch. This is where we're at. So all customers have the option to contribute their rebates toward developing local renewable energy resources. That's our Green Plus program, or donating their rebates to fund local nonprofit projects that lower greenhouse gas emissions and support low-income rate payers, or they can keep their rebates. So you have your choice. And the next slide will basically show our branding uh, of these three different products. Everybody's automatically enrolled in the MV Choice. That's the 3% uh, discount across the board. And then these two other programs that we're working on developing, 
actually I see there's uh, MB Green is listed twice. There, the other one should be M, uh, MB Share. And we're working with the community foundations to figure out the programmatic uh, aspects of how we would uh, use them as the repository for donor advised funds. We could even have our own fund uh, to uh, put some of these monies in and then move them out to the community to generate benefits to lower income rate payers, disadvantaged communities, et cetera. Uh, next slide. In terms of um, revenue, local rebate revenue is the 3% off of our total revenue. Looks to be about projected uh, $174 uh, million dollars. Uh, this year, in a full year, it'll be about $210 million. So in the next three years, you're looking at rebate revenue going back to customers, uh, a little over $5 million, $10 million, and then $11.4 million. On the programmatic side, again, 2% of total revenue. And uh, over the next three years, and those are going into those two buckets, the share program and the green plus, $3.5 million, $4.8 million, $11.4 million. Uh, the goal really is to uh, build reserves, and you see that building. Uh, we want to be uh, uh, fiscally responsible so that we can uh, have more flexibility about how we can procure our power and how we can operate as an agency. And so what this means is quickly paying off our debt, uh, which is um, $3 million, a line of credit of 10, and then uh, a loan to the County of Santa Cruz for about 550000 and then start to position ourselves so that we can become uh, bonded, have three years of uh, revenue to show, and 50% uh, of operations uh, in reserves. And that's going to allow us to uh, do away with the escrow account, the lockbox, and uh, be able to uh, do much better job in terms of negotiating contracts to get lower cost energy on the wholesale market. Next slide. There we are. Sorry about that. Catching up. Two phases. So we're launching our commercial, industrial, agricultural, and municipal accounts. This is going to be March. Uh, two notices go out in advance of that to all customers, and then two notices afterwards. Uh, and then phase two will bring on the residential customers in July. Same process. Uh, two notices to all customers in advance and two afterwards. Uh, Let's go to the next slide. Uh, before we get to recent accomplishments, uh, on the notification and sort of uh, people having the ability of choice, since everybody is already automatically enrolled in the program, uh, folks will have the opportunity to uh, stay with Monterey Bay Community Power, uh, carbon-free portfolio at 3% less than PG&E. If they want to take their 3% and move it into those other buckets, they can do that, or they can choose to opt out, stay with PG&E. I do want to make mention that all of uh, PG&E's care programs are still fully available with Monterey Bay Community Power, so you're not giving up any anything on PG&E's programmatic side, uh, very important. And um, we'll be working with the um, public information officers, uh, with the uh, municipalities that have next door accounts to try and push our information out, uh, as well as the mandated postcards, doing uh, public workshops and forums as well uh, in terms of getting the word out. In terms of accomplishments, um, implementation plan obviously submitted to the CPUC. Agreements have been signed. We've gotten our registration. We're up and running. We've leased office space. We're about uh, halfway staffed up to a full complement of about uh, 18 people. And uh, next slide. And the next slide. In terms of community outreach, obviously this is the big push right now. We're going to be having a um, major press launch. It's either going to be the first or the second of uh, March. Uh, it'll be down in Monterey. Everybody's going to be invited. <coughs> and we'll work toward uh, providing uh, events in uh, all three counties in terms of doing forum outreach uh, for folks. Next slide. Uh, I think we've gone through the milestones. And I think that concludes, actually. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Council, hopefully, any hopefully questions? that wasn't too long. Chuck? 
Yeah, um, I know there was consideration of a advisory body. I'm not sure if that's the correct Yeah, no, name. thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Yes, um, um, there was, I went to the joint meeting a couple weeks ago, so I know that was still in discussion, but I was wondering what happens. Uh, so we're going to bring back a proposal. Uh, it's in process. It's going to come to the uh, policy board on, um, I think it's March 7th, is our first Wednesday meeting. And uh, I, I think what it's looking like at this point is uh, having a larger um, community advisory group or committee. Uh, we're really trying to figure out in order to get this right and make it successful and have it be a, um, a leverage uh, to both boards uh, is to uh, figure out what the scope is going to be. Uh, we're working through the various sectors to kind of uh, figure out the uh, component of how many people would represent which di what different constituencies. Obviously, we want a broad representation and then uh, move forward on getting to work on actually determining which uh, projects or programs uh, would be uh, implemented within the first three years. So that's where the process is at. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a public portion. Anyone want to comment on the pr presentation? Can we uh, dispel one rumor? Um, we just received some letters from some activists regarding uh, the fact that no one will pay more for their PG&E with the CCA than they are paying for PG&E right now. No, in fact, they'll pay less. Correct. Correct. Just wanted to say that yeah. for the record. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. We appreciate Thank it. for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Very good. Thank you. And now we'll move on to the last item on our agenda, a review of marijuana sales, processing, and cultivation ordinance. And just to let the council know that there's, this is not a, a, a firm decision item. This is only direction to staff to bring us back um, examples, more information, uh, options that we might pursue. So staff, tell us about this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Um, oh. <laughs> Bear with me. Dude. <laughs> Let me start that again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was channeling. <laughs> Stephanie, you're smart. So by way of background, <laughs> as the city council recalls, in 1996, the state uh, passed Proposition 215, which legalized the cultivation, processing, and use of marijuana for qualified medical purposes. Uh, some years after, in 2014, the City Council adopted an urgency ordinance to prohibit commercial cultivation and processing within the city, uh, although we continue to recognize uh, qualified medical use and limited cultivation as was allowed by the state. In 2016, the California voters uh, approved the Adult Use of Marijuana Act, which essentially uh, legalized the recreational use, cultivation, and sales of marijuana. Uh, however, that does require uh, permits from local agencies, and we do have the ability to enact reasonable regulations. Uh, last year, we discussed uh, with the City Council whether or not we wanted to get into the commercial marijuana business. Uh, the City Council deliberated on that item and ultimately decided to keep the prohibitions in place pending additional time to uh, study what the state was going to do with regulations and also as other agencies develop their best practices. Uh, the exceptions being the council did allow laboratory testing services and uh, acknowledged the delivery services originated outside the city uh, was uh, an operation that the city really didn't, wasn't able to enforce. Uh, as part of that, uh, the city council did direct us to return in a year uh, to review some of the state regulations and those best practices. So after that meeting, uh, the state of California uh, adopted the Medicinal and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act. Uh, this act established a California Bureau of Cannabis Control, uh, which requires all commercial marijuana businesses to obtain a state license and retains the city's right to control what, if any, types of marijuana activities are allowed in their jurisdiction. Uh, the act created 20 distinct license types, for example, cultivation, retail, and testing. And cities and counties under this act must authorize any applications to the state for a commercial license. This slide just gives you an idea the, of the different approaches that have been taken by agencies in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. Uh, the Santa Cruz counties are highlighted in yellow. Uh, currently, Capitola and Scotts Valley have an outright prohibition, while the county and city of Santa Cruz are allowing 
uh, most of the uh, commercial types of marijuana uh, businesses. So this evening, staff is seeking direction basically on two options. The first option would be to take no action, leave our current prohibitions in place, and under this option, there really be no additional work that we would need to do. Uh, the other option would be to direct staff to develop options to allow commercial marijuana uses. Uh, if directed, staff would perform additional research, study best practices in more detail, and then schedule a future city council hearing to offer options and receive further direction on issues like the types of uses that the council might want to pursue, the number of licenses, uh, location criteria, and taxation. Uh, I would add that if the city council wants to take this option and but knows that there may be certain use types like manufacturing or cultivation that you're not interested in, uh, staff would welcome that direction because it'll help focus uh, the work that we do between now and, and returning to you at a future date. So that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Before we open up for questions, perhaps the chief could come forward because I think some of the questions are going to be directed towards you. And council um, staff and our chief of police are available for questions. Ed, do you have anything? A couple questions. One is just on the policy, just for clarification. Either the chief or Rich might know this, but I'm concerned about um, what the existing laws are right now for medical and recreational as far as uh, amount of plants that are be allowed to be cultivated by residents, non-commercial. It's my understanding, Chief, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you're still allowed to have six plants that you can grow on site. Medical or recreational, there's no difference. Correct. Currently, with the new um, protocols at the state level, it's cannabis now. And the reason it's called cannabis is because they've combined basically medicinal and recreational marijuana. So Rich is right, six total plants uh, at a residential location um, is the most that you can grow, and you can't grow six outdoors and six indoors, six total plants. Okay, and they, and they have to be grown in a greenhouse or within an enclosure, correct? Within an enclosure. They can't be in the vegetable garden. That's right. Got it. Okay, and uh, another question I have is, um, this is more of an opinion, I guess I'm gonna put you on the spot here, Chief, is I'm, I'm concerned about what you think, if there's any potential impact on our police force, additional staffing, uh, safety of our personnel based on implementation of legalization of marijuana. Let me, Should let me we? I'll try and answer or address each of those, but I may have to ask you, uh, Council Member, to go down line again. So I'll start with the potential impact on staff. Was that the first one? I, I'm asking about what do you think there might be the impact on the police force if, if we have if we adopt either manufacturing, cultivation, or dispensaries, I guess is primarily the most imp important. How do you think that's going to impact our department as far as crime, safety of our personnel? Uh, Let, let's see if I can address crime potential first generically speaking. One of the difficulties that I think all the municipalities and the police departments, or more specifically law enforcement is confronted with currently, is we don't have uh, a lot of data uh, for those cities who have decided to go forward with commercial uh, uh, sales in, in their cities um, to determine, for instance, a number of calls for service for a single location or for a group of locations in an area. And you all know that for police departments and for police chiefs, uh, we like to utilize calls for service data uh, as an indication of potential crime in given neighborhoods or at a given location or in this instance for a typical uh, usage that might be considered uh, in a city. So it's difficult to do. Uh, I will say that uh, as a result of Prop 64 and the uh, eventual trailer bill that was enacted in May of this year, uh, California Police Chiefs was greatly involved in some of the discussion leading up to that trailer bill. And there are quite a few changes uh, that have now been codified under the new Business and Professions Code under the direction of the Bureau of Cannabis Control that have lessened some of the concern for the police chiefs throughout the state. Now that was anecdotal concern, that was not concern related to raw or true data as it relates to, for instance, commercial sales. Um, some of the data and some of the concern that, and I am a member of the Cal Chiefs uh, Marijuana Policy Committee. We've been in place for about the last nine months or so discussing all of these things that most of the cities, cities are currently discussing. Uh, some of the anecdotal data, or actually credible data, that came forward and was presented prior to Prop 64 does have, in my opinion, a relationship as it relates to potential concern or potential criminal concern related to commercial businesses, for instance, retail outlets or commercial grows 
or, or other types of usages that we might be or that we in fact are con uh, considering. Um, so there has been discussion related to that uh, credible information um, and it's valuable to consider that. And uh, as, as I mentioned a moment ago, the Bureau of Cannabis Control uh, has provided opportunities for most of the cities who are in the same position of us, which is basically in a hold pattern, uh, Rich stated, waiting for um, best practices to maybe surface and, and follow the lead. I don't know that those best practices exist yet, simply because there are not enough cities who have adopted um, uh, ordinances or legalized, for instance, uh, retail sales to compare it to the reaction or the concern or the potential for crime concern because of that passage of their local laws. Um, with regard to uh, safety of the officers, uh, so before I get to that, it's difficult to say if there's a, 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 um, an impact on personnel, needed personnel, or delivery of police officers in Capitola. Um, I think the reality is whenever we have regulatory schemes in place that hope to properly govern a location or govern a use, there needs to be personnel in place that can properly manage that usage that has been adopted by a city. And so I think it is um, uh, wise to consider that there are police resources that would be necessary even outside of criminal potential as it relates to a safety impact on the police department. Uh, and I think that's more specific to if in fact there was crime potential, um, what type of crime potential would that be? Uh, and does that crime potential introduce safety concerns for police officers? It's, it's difficult to, to answer that with the exception of some of the concerns and some of the known crimes that were related to prior to Prop 64 and the passage of 64 were related to, for instance, medicinal dispensaries. And there is a good number of uh, data. There is a good number of crimes that occurred uh, throughout the, the state of California, violent crimes that were associated with medicinal dispensaries. Not to suggest that there's a direct correlation between those crimes um, and the passage of Prop 64 and recreational sales, commercial uh, marijuana activity, for instance. I don't want to suggest that there is a correlation, but that data does exist and has been examined by Cal Chiefs. Your third question was, if I can uh, ask I, you to repeat. You've covered most. I just have one more final question. It's just I, uh, of the four operations, cultivation, dispensaries, distribution, or manufacturing, which one do you feel there's either the data or your opinion puts us most at risk? Can you add, can you add delivery into that list? Because I think that was something that was discussed. Well, do we? Is that okay, Ed? That, like, you know, I'm thinking distribution is just covered in delivery, but if you want to add that, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Because there were there some significant instances with that. Do we have Please. any land for cultivation? No, that was what I was thinking. There's no yeah. land that's zoned agricultural no. for it. Understood. These are the only four categories, right, so, so I just wanted to just going to add. Yeah. yeah. Right. Dispensaries and retail are, in my opinion, one and the same. And, and the reason being is medicinal benefit recreational usage is cannabis activity and so a dispensary uh, may occupy the same brick and board building for medicinal purposes as a retail outlet so i'm going to combine those two uh, a, a grow site larger in scale um, larger footprint if you will uh, traditionally grow locations throughout california have uh, introduced um, a significant criminal concern uh, I do believe that some of the uh, restrictions and some of the requirements and, and some of the significant changes um, post Prop 64 have managed properly some of those concerns as they relate to commercial grow sites, for instance. Um, deliveries, if I can, uh, and I think it would be important for council to hear the specific definition from the state of California as it relates to a delivery service. And the reason it's important because up until the point that uh, uh, the business and professions code was introduced, I found that each municipality had their own version and their own definition of a delivery service, of distribution, of a dispensary, um, of a grow location. So I think it's important if we're gonna talk about deliveries, which is of great concern to me. And I do have an opinion on criminal uh, potential criminal activity related to deliveries, but let me let me if I can read the definition of a delivery uh, service based upon the, the state uh, business and professions code 
Delivery means the commercial transfer of cannabis or cannabis products to a customer. Delivery also includes the use by a retailer of any technology platform. I'll, re I'll read distribution as well because there's a difference. Distribution means the procurement, sale, and transport of cannabis and cannabis products between licenses. Commercial activity, commercial cannabis activity, not medicinal, not recreational, commercial cannabis activity, includes the cultivation, possession, manufacture, distribution, processing, storing, laboratory testing, packaging, labeling, transportation, delivery, or sale of cannabis and cannabis products as, pro as provided within this business and professions code. So having stated that and read those definitions, um, as the Chief of Police in Capitol, I'm happy that we made the decision in early 17 to amend our ordinance so that we don't allow any commercial marijuana activity so that it put us in a position where that activity wasn't forced upon us simply by way of a state license, someone coming into town with a state license and us not having a code in place that says no commercial marijuana activity. Um, let me talk about delivery uh, service. Uh, I do believe that that's the highest potential for criminal activity. Uh, and, and it has nothing to do with uh, the legalization of marijuana in California. It has to do simply with taking a product um, that is attractive to many people and of most concern to me is the youth population, quite honestly, uh, taking a product from a retail outlet into a vehicle from point A to destination B and really no viable security training, security practice, security component in between point A and point B. And whether there are 100 cannabis outlets in a city uh, or one, there will always be a portion of the criminal population that will target delivery services um, because they like to commit crime potentially, because they would like to get their hands on, it's a cash only business that may or may not change in California. Uh, there may be cash in the car. There is marijuana product in the car. You are able to sell that product on the street. There's significant concern uh, as it relates to the black market as a result of the passage of Prop 64. Um, that black market concern, for instance, in, in uh, Colorado still exists. Their legalization passed in 2012. That black market concern, which they state represents 70 percent of the marijuana usage and sales in their state uh, is still uh, as much significant concern today in 2018 uh, as it was in 2012. I spoke to an assistant chief in Denver uh, not too long ago on a completely different topic um, and he shared with me that they are no closer to properly regulating their marijuana industry in Colorado than they were in 2012 and so it has become a challenge. Chief is that the black market um, have to do primarily with avoidance of tax and taxes? Potentially it could. That, that is, um, uh, it does have to, it could have to do with the avoidance of tax for, for the user. If you can pay less on the street for the same or similar product, then you have to expect that some are going to do that. Okay. I'm sorry, Ed, anything no, I'm, else? I'm done. Okay. Good, thank you. I just have a, yeah. I have a quick question to follow up. Um, so when you were talking about the, um, definition of delivery the last line you said was the use of any technology platform is that in, to deliver to advertise to order what, what how does that all of the above so any any um any delivery service using any kind of uh technological platform to advertise or anything just their advertisement in and of itself is considered a delivery that's correct and i don't know this for a fact but I'll share my opinion that the intent with including technology platform is the great concern with regard to the advertising of cannabis products in the hands of youth. Okay, and that, and just again, just to confirm, that's just for the delivery um, businesses, or if any, like if there was a retail shop that had technological, you know, ordering, like you could order online or something, is that now considered a delivery, or was it just for the businesses specifically? designed as delivery businesses that if they advertise on technology, it's considered a delivery. If there is a technology platform that allowed, for instance, for a 
um, user or patient to order online and they receive that product from the uh, retail outlet that's that's delivery of cannabis does that answer your question kind of so so yeah I, I understand that if it's actually delivered to them once they order online then it's considered a delivery um, but if I understood correctly it sounded like what you were saying is that the in the um, definition of delivery is in and of itself the use of any technology platform which made me think if, if we have just a retail shop they don't deliver um, but they do have online ordering or online delivery or excuse me online uh, advertisement does that somehow now qualify them as delivery uh, or was I misunderstanding I, I'm, I'm looking at the actual code section and I think the simple answer to your question is it's confusing the way it's written in the code. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at it right here. It says delivery means the commercial transfer of cannabis or cannabis products to the customer. And then it says delivery also inc includes the use by a retailer of any technology platform. I think on the face of it, it's difficult to discern yeah. exactly what that means. Okay. So I think that the, the, the challenge that I think the chief's having in answering the question is simply that that, that bit of code on its face um, is a little non sure. sensical. Sure. Well, I so, mean, we can make an assumption. I don't know if we want to do that, but it's it's not written well. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, that's my question I, too. I What's a assume. delivery platform? <laughs> you know, I. I mean, I, I'm very low tech, but that's above we'll, me. We'll hear, the, platform. we'll hear from the we'll hear from the public. We might yeah. we might still be educated from the public. My guess is that I know that there are apps available where you can use the technology platform to have something delivered to your front door. So, but we can move away from that. Instead of rewriting the code, Jacques, you have questions. Oh. I'm going to keep yeah. moving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. um, so you made a point of saying that the uh, delivery portion is what you feel is the most prone to crime. Um, do you have any um, data on that, or um, experience with that, or is this like? contributing an extra 1%, 20% or more to the crime load on any particular police department? I mean, it's area dependent, but I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, what makes you feel that way. It seems to me it is because someone's in the car, they have product, and like you said, people want that. So just trying to get an idea of your experience or what you know about that since you're on that council. I don't have numeric data uh, to introduce to support my concern. Um, I have a good number of years experience in, in, in San Diego um, that I, um, I believe supports my concern that delivery services um, introduce criminal potential. Um, simply because they're always an easier target uh, because usually it's one person driving a single car. Um, the other portion of that that is rather good news is um, locations, buildings, uh, rather than delivery, so an outlet or, or a, a commercial building. Um, years ago when medicinal marijuana um, was being provided to patients and non-patients, being honest. There was as much concern of criminal potential at that structure, at that address, as there was criminal potential related to marijuana, medicinal or otherwise, anywhere else. The industry has made great strides in bringing forward security measures to mm. protect themselves and to support, um, uh, to an extent, law enforcement's concern. Mm -hmm. That same level of concern and effort uh, has not, in my opinion, been introduced to the delivery side of the cannabis and cannabis industry. So perhaps um, any business here in town could work with you to help um, address those uh, security concerns. Related to deliveries? Yeah. I'm not in favor of delivery services. You're just not in favor, okay. And what would you think of if we did go along that direction of um, licensing delivery services uh, requiring uh, security to travel with them. 
would that present a problem? Would you think that would help mitigate, or maybe that's just a Band-Aid that doesn't really work? Well, I'll say that it doesn't, uh, a, a program like that mandating the business to provide some level of security to travel with them does not minimize or exclude the need for a larger number of law enforcement personnel to manage that crime potential. One follow-up question. <coughs> um, so what's your sense of what people nearby, if it's businesses, we have it in a business neighborhood, or if it's somewhere else in the city, I'm concerned about the public's reaction to businesses of this sort, whether it's delivery or dispensing. What are some of the issues that come up that um, you're familiar with from your experience? Well, I, I think it's safe to say that the zoning component, should, should the city of Capitola go forward with authorizing this type of use, the zoning component is greatly important, um, which I suppose would um, require a level of community feedback. As it relates to concerns uh, of cannabis business, uh, my own personal thought is that it would make no sense to have those businesses from <coughs> a zoning perspective occupy an area that is, for instance, at the end of a cul-de-sac in a dark portion of the neighborhood. <laughs> that would make no sense at all. Right. Um, Visibility is important. I, I believe there's crime potential related to the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that crime potential is probably two or threefold if you don't locate those industries in the, in the proper place based upon zoning ordinances or zoning requirements. Do you feel this potential will lessen as more and more businesses set up? Or, you know, it's like dispersing the problem. I, you know, I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, how increasing the industry is going to affect this, or is it always going to be a problem and it's just going to be dispersed a little bit more? Well, I don't think that you can compare, uh, for instance, an increased number of authorized cannabis businesses in a city um, and a suggestion that that lessens the potential for crime and compare that to the banking industry. I don't believe that. That's been suggested more than a few times. I, I think the the reality that it's a cash-only business right. forever or for a period of time um, will always introduce a level of criminal potential. Um, at the location, in a vehicle, uh, upon a person if they're delivering on foot. I think that makes it difficult to manage the industry uh, from a law enforcement perspective, honestly. The other part that is worth discussing is the data has proven that our youth population, while more and more, and I think there's eight to 10 states in the US now that have legalized recreational marijuana, uh, while more and more states have legalized and others are considering, studies have shown that the youth population, specifically in one of the surveys I'm familiar with is fifth graders to 11th graders, their perception of the, um, their concern of ingesting marijuana is decreasing. So as it normalizes in our society, it, the concern for kids and their perception that it could harm them decreases. Uh, that, that's of great concern to me. Those same studies, and you're probably all familiar with them, uh, now you know, suggest scientifically that the, um, the adolescent brain is not formed until you're 25 years old. Years ago, they thought it was you know, 16 or 18 or whatever. And so as it relates to uh, cannabis, um, commercial sales, and access to cannabis, in the hands of youth, I think that that is outside of, that's the greatest concern for our society, is how do we prevent, outside of the business and profession code, outside of local ordinances, outside of everything that's on paper that says youth shall not and are not allowed to consume marijuana, how do we keep it out of their hands? Thank you, Jacques. It's already on the increase. Chief, thank you very much. We're fortunate to have uh, you on our team and, and leading our team. Thank you. It's, we keep on stumbling over great police chiefs. I don't understand how it happens. Must be a great place to be a chief. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and with regard, to the with, with regard to the adolescent brain, I'm thinking 65, 70, but that's okay. <laughs> Any other questions of staff? 
Seeing none, I will open this up to the public. Anyone who would like to address the council on this subject, please come forward. Speak to us. Hello, uh, my name is Sam Laforti. I'm the principal at New Consulting Services. Um, we do a lot of canvas-related land use and permitting work for the industry, and I'd just like to volunteer my time with the city on this issue. I am a, am a local resident. I'm in, I'm in Aptos, though, not in Capitola. Um, I work with a variety of cannabis-related companies from Alameda County through San Diego currently. And after analyzing a lot of small towns and the ordinances that are being written and working with both uh, municipal staff and county staff, a city like Capitola should look at the current regulations and the regulations of the cities and municipalities sur surrounding it. I mean, currently a delivery service in the city of Capitola will have a very limited function in comparison to what the uh, previous licensed delivery service had. Um, that's because the county of Santa Cruz in their new draft ordinance has banned delivery from anyone that's not licensed in the unincorporated county. The city of Santa Cruz has done the same thing within city limits. So currently, based on the city and the county's ordinance, they've created a monopoly in one company, I won't name them here, who can deliver anywhere within the city and the county. The only place that they're restricted from delivering currently is Capitola. Um, I can guarantee you that there is canvas delivery occurring in Capitola, whether it be through unlicensed delivery services or through the US mail. There are multiple companies shipping product overnight into all of these areas and they're not paying taxes. Um, there are three of them specifically in San Francisco functioning who have been functioning under the previous license version and now under Makursa who are sucking away tax dollars from the city. Moving forward, if the city does um, see commercial canvas activities as a potentially safe business, which I believe they can be easily, um, I believe a retail brick and mortar lo location is the only option that will be viable to the commercial industry. And I think there are reasonable safety concerns that the police chief has addressed um, tonight that can be overcome. I think if the city of Capitola is going to look for um, mere images of other municipalities to look at, look at Monterey Bay Alternative Medicine in the city of Del Rey Oaks. They have a very good relationship with the police. They, all of their camera system is fully monitored and recorded by um, Del Rey Oaks. It, provides a huge level of transparency. They're located right next to the police. Um, the city of Capitola has a lot of concerns associated with safety, which I, I hear the chief and I understand his concerns. Um, look at that MBAM model, the Del Rey Oaks model. Look at the properties so opening up right next to this location, right across the street, for instance. Limit or greatly restrict the areas that a can commercial cannabis company could go to. When you're looking at the tax revenue and the potential for the city of, of Capitola, cultivation, manufacturing aren't going to give you the same potential tax revenue. This is a haven for tourists. I worked here all through college. I worked right in the village. I bar backed for years. I waited tables. I did all that. You've got seven months to make a lot of tax revenue and a commercial dispensary um, can provide that for the city. We can overcome, the city can e easily overcome a lot of safety concerns by having additional safety related and transparency mechanisms built into any operation that's allowed. And I think the potential's there, the tourist traffic is there. Um, I understand the police chief's concerns associated with the delivery service, but a delivery service within the city of Capitola, I think is actually a good idea. It would be very limited. The deliveries would be um, small scale because you're only within the city. And a lot of the people who need medical cannabis, the people who really need it, they're not buying high THC strains. They're buying um, lower THC or higher CBD strains. And those are the people who have mobility issues. Um, if the city wants to be able to allow those people to still have access to the medical aspect of cannabis, a small-scale delivery service associated with a retail operation, I think, could serve the community well. It's not going to be a moneymaker for the retailer. There's just no way. The population's too small. Um, 
but it it will it will assist the people who really do need the cannabis in the medical portion. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council? Okay, then we'll bring it back and uh, before anybody makes any motions, <laughs> let's all, you know, voice where we feel we might want to go at some time in the future for direction to staff and the places we definitely don't want to go, and then we'll proceed on to a vote in direction. Stephanie, you want to start? Well, I've off? been asking everybody I've seen this week what do they think, and I've gotten mostly. I don't know. I don't care. I don't think it's it's here. You know, you know, whatever. Um, a couple of people said no. They just didn't want that activity in Capitola, anywhere. If I said uh, industrial area or 41st Avenue, they said absolutely not. So I'm willing to look at it and see and get some um, get some ideas about it. Um, I think I heard you say that cultivation and, pro and manufacture is not well, something we can. Tolerate. Well, we don't have a, we don't have a place for cultivation. I don't believe. Don't you have to have it zoned agricultural? We don't have any agricultural land. We just did our general plan. I mean, you can, it, I can it put a greenhouse a, on it. It would take a warehouse, and we only have one street that has any warehouses on it. And you could put a warehouse on <laughs> industrial land and grow there, or is that considered well, we, agriculture? We have the ability to cater our zoning ordinance how we see fit, but I think it would have to be an indoor facility. It's hard to imagine too many parcels of land that have the, the area needed to do an indoor facility. But Yeah. I mean, if the, all those businesses changed and we had a whole bunch of vacant land, you know, we could look at that for whatever. But we don't we don't have any space yeah. there, and we don't have any agricultural land to grow any on. So, I think those those should be those are kind of no, um, not not possible for us to look at. Thank you, Stephanie. Jacques. So, um, I think this is an issue that I have no clear idea about whether residents of Capitola would, <laughs> one way or the other, feel that this is something they'd like to see in their city, in terms of. The image of the city in terms of you know why they moved to Capitola, as the police chief mentioned, the effect on their children. So I think before we move forward, we should um, provide a form and actually work towards trying to understand. It's um, a significant issue for many people. It's very emotional. Um, we we've come off of um, at least since I've been born. Um, you know, war on drugs, um, ongoing issues uh, related to drugs, trying to understand what is at the root of the problem, whether it's emotional lack of development or criminal activity or whatever. I mean, it's, it's a very fraught issue in this community. It's, it's not a simple one as trying to establish any other business. So I think um, it's incumbent upon us to ask our residents what they feel about this and try to get a sense of the pulse in terms of this community. Uh, we're not other communities. And I think everyone up here at this dais and involved in the city here realize that. So at first step, we should provide that. Uh, second step is um, I'm aware that uh, marijuana dispensaries and any related business can pay a significant amount of monies for their um, rental, wherever they may be. Um, I'm concerned that um, it would crowd out other businesses in terms of rentals and make it uh, less available. F uh, excuse me, uh, rental agencies um, might prefer that because of the high rents. So I'm, I'm a little worried about crowd out issues. Um, I'm also worried about the effect of such a business on adjacent businesses. So not only I'm concerned about the people who live in capital, I'm also concerned about the businesses that would be near such a business. Um, that could be very deleterious to their potential customers. So I think we need to be very careful about that. So if we ever do consider um, establishing um, a license and making that available in this city, we need to be cognizant of the fact that there's other businesses. We need to talk about where they may be located in references in reference to those other businesses. Um, those are some of my concerns at this time. I'm I'm trying to get a better understanding of, um, and I th I hope as this discussion furthers some of the points that the chief has brought up, and I think we need to take those into account very seriously. Um, 
there's many things um, when you're under the influence in driving. How does the police uh, respond to that? How, how does someone respond to a situation where you're trying to determine and we don't have any real way? It's not, there's no breathalyzer or anything like that. Um, how does it influence activity in the neighborhoods and such like that? Um, you know, I grew up in the 60s and the 70s, and I'm not going to go through my experiences, but it's been a gradual progression, and now basically I can't walk down the street in many cases, and, you know, there's this marijuana everywhere in many places, and I'm just starting to get used to it, so it's kind of weird, you know, coming from the standpoint if I had a simple whatever or my car I happened to be in when it was pulled over and there was something in the floor and then you get arrested to now you walk down the street and you're starting to smell it everywhere. Um, stop the stop sign and the car next to you, they're smoking. Uh, it's sort of a weird feeling from my perspective. Having seen it before and now gone through its progressive acceptance I, I do really agree that the effect on youth is is amazing. Um, in the 60s and 70s, when it was more or less a, a drug of trying to expand your mind, then I saw what it did to the, the siblings and the kids and the families where the older uh, brothers and sisters did it as part of their growing up in high school or college, and then they got into it, and then it in many cases, their lives just spiraled out of control. So is this something that we want to condone and uh, deal with in such a way that uh, youth sort of thinks it's okay, it's not okay, especially at that age? I think the main burden is really on parents and how does society respond to these issues? And I don't know if we're ready for it. But uh, getting back to my first point, I think we really do need to go to our citizenry and uh, see what their uh, point is, what their points are, and what their things, <coughs> what their feelings are. And if we do allow anything in this city, I think um, where it's located, we need to talk to the residents, uh, excuse me, the businesses nearby, be cognizant of the fact that they may be very concerned also um, about having such a business near them. Thank you, Jacques. Christian. Yeah, um, you know, I think that cultivation and distribution and manufacturing, delivery, um, it, it just doesn't seem right for our size of a city. And and really, um, as Councilmember Harlan mentioned, the um, you know we don't have the kind of agricultural space need, needed for something like cultivation. Um, dispensaries, in and of themselves, I don't. I'm willing to look into that. Um, I hear the police chief and, and his concerns that he's sharing with us. Um, and if we chose to go forward um, with dispensaries or, or retail shops, what, what would be the correct terminology here? Retail. Or retail? retail, okay. So if we choose to go forward with retail, I think that it would be worth it for us to consider a limited number um, within a certain amount of distance, either from each other and obviously from schools and, and whatnot. Um, but then also if we move forward, I think it would be interesting um, if we direct staff to do further research on this to determine if the green cross signs are legally required in front of retail stores. Um, because if we're concerned about crime or youth identifying uh, locations where they can get such things, those green crosses are bright Beacons. lights <laughs> of this is where the pot is, come, come steal it from us. <laughs> so um, I think it would be worth looking into that um, because if we can say no green cross signs, I would definitely say no green cross signs. And then the people that are looking for it and know how to find it will find it, and the people that are just kind of wandering down the street um, won't, which is it good. wouldn't meet our sign ordinance, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> we have that going for us. Yeah. Ed, what do you, uh, did you, were you finished? Were you yes, finished, Christian? Thank you. Yeah. Ed, what do you know? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know a lot. I just have my opinions, but uh, I'm willing to share those. I believe this is Pandora's box, and once we open it, we're not going to come back from it. I think the last time we had this conversation, I was adamant against not having marijuana at all. I think I'm 100% fan of option one. Uh, I think that uh, th I can list a dozen reasons, okay, why we should not do this, and there's only one why we should, and that's because of the revenue. And as much as I'm the revenue hawk on this council, 
I don't want any part of it. I, I, I feel like it is a, a it, we are trying to draw a line with, with kids, with attitude. Um, I mean, just from what I saw tonight earlier about people driving down somebody's street, this, people can get excited about that. They don't realize this room is empty about this topic right now, which I think is a big deal that's gonna impact this town. And once it's here and they realize it, that it's just, in my mind, this is something that could run amok in the town. I don't believe the people that live here, the people that are invested, you know, people are talking about, I mean, they brought it up, not me, million dollar homes, they're coming here. What they want is they want some kind of security in this town. And I think our police department right now is is taxed as it is. Uh, people don't realize, so I, we do because some of us do ride alongs, how, you know, how busy they are and the kind of work that they're doing. And there was a comment tonight about, well, we can just go park our cops over on Topaz and write tickets, you know, it's not like they have time to do that. And the impact of marijuana in this town, I mean, I think the chief, thank you for your presentation, by the way, but you know, he, he, he alluded to the fact that this is gonna increase what they have to do. It's just gonna, it's just gonna cause there to be an impact. Um, I'm not prepared to fund to hire, you know, two more police officers per shift to cover this and try to justify that the offset of the revenue we make from the taxes covers the idea of what there's gonna be an impact. I think that I want to go with, you know, and, I'm, and I'm going to look at the chart here, I want to understand that, that Watsonville has a ban. Scotts Valley has a ban. Oh. Okay. And, and the, the, the Watsonville, all they allowed was cultivation and, and uh, manufacturing. And, and understand one thing, cultivation manufacturing, it's all indoors. Where this is not like, this isn't Humboldt County where we're growing this stuff in the wilderness. This is all indoor factories, warehouses, it's where it's grown. So I would like to be go along with the cities of Scotts Valley and Watsonville that have already decided we want no part of this. I want no part of this. That would be my recommendation. My feelings on this, first of all, in correction, Watsonville doesn't want any, doesn't not want any part of it. They already have cultivation and manufacture and the mayor of Watsonville has informed no, me. Dispensaries, I'm talking about dispensaries. The mayor of Watsonville has informed me that dispensaries and distribution will be part of it at their next meeting. So what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that that's good, what I'm saying is everybody is still processing this and everybody's still talking about it. So in keeping with this particular agenda item with as terms of not making decisions tonight, I think it warrants further talking about. I think that um, I am not, things I'm not in favor in, of is um, manufacturing and cultivation, certainly not. We don't have the resources for it in any way, shape or form. I also, on the, on the chief's recommendation, do not think we should allow delivery. Um, there may be a case for medical delivery. That can be covered by the individuals themselves without us coming out in favor of it and actually allowing it. Um, I think that it's, it's worthy of further discussion and a public hearing to hear about retail in a finite, with a finite number of licenses that travel with the retailer, not the property. Um, and well, while it's not in any way, shape or form a reason to accept it, we need to hear about the tax benefits of it um, because we wouldn't be doing our due diligence if we didn't. Uh, I think that the, um, the zoning is very important and anything less intense than regional commercial should not even be considered. I don't want to hear about it in community commercial or neighborhood commercial or any of that. It's, either, it's down 41st Avenue or nothing at all. So, and these are just possibilities in my mind. Um, well, along with other cities still plumbing the depths of this and knowing that at either end of 41st Avenue, you can walk into either of those stores and buy what you want. I think that it's worth to bring it back to us and hear more information. And it doesn't have to come back in two weeks. It can come back in a month or, or a month and a half whenever the, we get more information. For now, we have a ban in place. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. But I think that we would, by just knee-jerking saying complete ban, we're playing to, again, the emotions of the devil marijuana, which we have all lived with, we have all observed, we have all seen the Reefer Madness movie, let's get past that and look at pure facts. The chief may even be able to bring us more data as retail stores develop and mature. So those are my feelings and I'll consider someone trying to come up with something that's a consensus that we can direct staff to. So 
I'll, about um, if we um, direct staff to come back with uh, some answers to some of the questions and concerns that we've heard tonight right, and I, some more information, fiscal analysis, uh, zoning, um, and so forth, just some more information about this. And I think you've heard the council, at, at f all five of us are definitely not in favor of um, cultivation and manufacturing. There's one of us who doesn't even want to talk about brick and mortar, but I think you stand alone on that, or is anyone else against brick and mortar? I, I thought that I heard, I thought the only thing I heard that there was interest in was a dispensary. Or am I missing something? Well, brick and mortar, retail. Okay. Call it a dispensary. I think, I think everybody else was pretty much in line with none of the others. None of the others. I stand alone as the only one against everything. Correct. Okay. Correct. But so I think the only thing we're talking about is a brick and mortar operation here, and that we want to hear more about it. I'm just trying to funnel his with the things he needs to research. And right, and that's and that's the only thing I think the council has a consensus on, is brick and mortar retail, not delivery, not dis not um, cultivation, not manufacturing. Do you have direction, staff? I, I would also. I think that there might be a consensus on where, if if, if heaven forbid, one was located, it would only be in, in the uh, what's the mall zoning? Is that C R district? Right, yeah, regional commercial. Right, that would be the only district I think. Are we feeling good about that? That yeah. we wouldn't want to go to any any lesser intense zoning areas no. with this. But I'd like to look at some information about delivery because there's been delivery going on, and I, we know there haven't been. I haven't heard of any crime sprees, but maybe we just haven't heard about them. But uh, I'd like some more information about that and any break-ins in the city of Santa Cruz. I think they've had a pretty good record in Santa Cruz with their two dispensaries that they've had for a number of years. And um, so I, but I'd like to get some more information about okay. some security concerns there and what just they data. do and just in general. And I think reaching out, I'm sure our chief will reach out to the chief in Santa, in Santa Cruz who we worked with and has a personal relationship with and can get some definitely some information on that. And I think what, you're, what you found in Santa Cruz is not what it was five or six years ago. The retailers that have survived, the dispensaries have matured to a level of professionalism yeah. that was not there. We could not have this conversation six years ago. It was a totally different climate. Oh, yeah. So it's wild west. It's worth it's worth hearing about that. And is your? Uh, I don't want to shut out delivery right now. I want to just get some more information about it. Getting data wouldn't hurt. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'd just Hold like on. to add something to that. If I Let, uh, Ed first. Just one more, I, I just want to answer the questions that are on here just for Rich. Also, the only other question was the, the attacks and if you want him to research what a potential oh, yeah, that, tax would be. Right, the, the, the monetary benefits and also the potential monetary drain that something like that would be because it's not just police action we're talking about, it's, it's licensing, zoning, approval, you know, the administrative things that Rich, you handle every day. Jacques, you had something? Um, yeah, I, I firmly believe that this is going to be of great interest. Uh, we just learned about not getting publicity out when we should have and getting back to the public. I think we've just gone through that and slapped a little bit around. So I'd like staff, when this comes back, to really put some effort into public notice so that people are aware in Capitola that this has been considered. And, and it would have to be something more of a press release because we can't mail cards to every single house in Capitola. but. I think letting everyone know so we can potentially fill up the chambers or we not. could take out it'd be a little expensive but we could take out ads in the papers I will say five uh, people on the at the Sentinel get our agenda good and I think if we and you saw what we got yeah right right that's why that's why I say so you know that's not good enough <laughs> yeah, I think, you know sure. sometimes you, pay, you have to pay for an ad that you know half the people probably don't see and there's the subscriptions to the Sentinel very low in Capitola, but it would be worth it to see if we could get in an ad for the Capitola Times if we could meet their deadline. Right. And, and, and they may be able to run a public hearing. They could run a PSA think, too. Contact the city council member, yeah. co council members, email us, uh, put a link up there if you want to for um, to um, for comments. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and so stuff like this, we need to s somehow, you know, send the newsletter out with an article and a and a link. Contact us because that way we'll get lots of people emailing us, you know, with their responses. Steph, you have your direction, and I think that in in spite of everything we do, all five of us have to be prepared to have someone come up there and ask us why we didn't do enough. Okay, I, I'd just like to add one more thing. So, um, our police chief gave us a pretty good report, and I would like that presentation to have a little more detail. A good report this time, but I think. You're aware of some of our concerns and 
in the next presentation address like what's happening locally and uh, maybe I think you have the idea because I just want to flesh out some of the things that you've brought up. That's that's my major concern. Okay, thank you. And on that note, last comment, we had our first meeting of the What's Next Committee, which is the best I could come up with, with for the Begonia Festival successor. Oh. And it was heavily attended. And it looks like there will be a Capitola Village Water Festival at the end of September. And if you could arrange for me to address the BIA, I would appreciate it because you are our ambassador to the BIA. Meeting on the 13th. <laughs> I'll be there. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Stephanie. Is that a board only meeting or? Board, what board? Well, some meetings you can go to and some you can't go to. The BIA? Is, yeah. you, can, you can go to it. I think you can go to anything you want. Yeah. Let's just, yeah. Be, let's just be careful of three council members attending the meeting, please. Oh, I thought it was yeah. Go ahead, Stephanie. I contacted the school about having an artist reception for our wonderful young artist at the school, and I'm going to, we'll, we'll pick a Saturday uh, that seems convenient for a couple hours, and I'll bring the refreshments, and we'll invite the students and their parents and their friends and families to have a real artist reception in this marvelous room, yeah. but, but uh, flowers and food and so forth, and, and we'll, I think we'll do that every time they have a show, because I want the students to, to be celebrated and to be thanked and to be honored for all their hard work and for the teacher to be honored and for them to get some publicity about this. Okay. Very excellent. And I know we how, how we love to keep on talking until 10 or 11, but the meeting is adjourned. Good night, Capitola. 10 or 11. We'll and be nice to each other.